Now, uh, Mark, a little bit earlier, I asked you about if you differ in regard to views uh, uh, of treatment based on etiology or what have we. Uh, based on the data from the uh, Limvatin versus Ravn data, uh, is there anything in the demographics or anything in regard to outcomes that really come to mind that you are kind of curious about or you'd like to say? You know, it's something where looking at the data, it's it, you know, looking at the study itself, it's sort of saying, okay, they're they're not inferior; they're pretty much equivalent. Which which group would I use lenvatinib? Which one would I would I use serafinib in if if the lenvatinib gets it gets approved? Um, I don't know if we again have definitive data pointing one way or the other. Uh, you know, the patients that we might want a response, maybe by modified resist, we might use it. Um, we might use lenvatinib, or you know, progression-free survival with no significant difference in overall survival. I'm not sure how to interpret that data uh, for sort of patients with metastatic disease. Well, interestingly, uh, I would say that um, uh, there are some components at least, and not necessarily for the statistical significance component here, but uh, the group with the hepatitis B was a little bit subtly different between the two. The AFP level also subtly different between the two. But uh, if this brings me to really a further explanation of the secondary endpoints, which really were quite impressive, despite that the non-inferiority, which was really the best we could reach, even though, by the way, the non-inferiority was really all the way at the edge in regard to the hazard rate ratio close to where the superiority would have kicked in. It was like 0.01 difference or 0.02 difference between where the end of the non-inferiority and the start of the superiority per se. But uh, Manish, uh, from your perspective, having a study with uh, amazing outcome in regard to PFS and regard to response as we just spoke, which is Limvatim in that case, uh, people will still wonder like, uh, but it's not inferior. How do you interpret that? Yeah, I think that this is an example of where you have to dive a little bit deeper into the data. If you just read the headline, it's going to not really give you the whole picture here. And, and when I first heard about this trial, I, I thought, well, why are we doing a non-inferiority study with a drug that we're, none of us are really thrilled with, which is serafinib, right? Why are we trying to establish non-inferiority to that? So when I looked deeper into the data, I saw, as you mentioned, a lot of the superiority on these secondary endpoints and really uh, the fact that, that uh, lenvatinib outperformed serafinib on, on all these endpoints. Uh, and I think the response rate to me was very telling, you know, in that that's something that, you know, is, 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 is objective, you know, uh, whether we use modified resist, whether we use resist 1.1, in either case, lenvatinib significantly outperforms serafinib, and, and shrinking tumors is always a good thing in oncology, you know. Uh, why, why it doesn't translate into an overall survival benefit in this case, I think there's a lot of theories about that, and maybe in this case it was just that, like you said, we were close, but didn't quite make it to the superiority edge, right? Um, and we do have a lot of therapies now in HCC, which is, I think, going to affect survival going forward. Um, but I think this is very encouraging data. Thrilled to have another option, you know, assuming that the lenvatinib does get FDA approved. It has not yet. But, but I think all of us who've seen the data believe that it will. And, and it would be great to have that other option. It's going to be a, a deal where all of us as medical oncologists are going to have to become familiar with the drug and, and really comfortable with it because we've had sort of serafinib has had that 10 year lead where you know we've all kind of learned how to use it, how to dose it, how to adjust it. And so I think there's a comfort level there. And now lenvatinib comes to the scene and we have to kind of figure it out again, you know, and fair, 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 fair. Yeah. No, no, this is very important. If anything, however, just to carry on because important points over here, uh, fascinating that uh, the lenvatinib data uh, did not necessarily also pan out this uh, superiority that we discussed, even though it edged towards it in regard to the study versus serafinib. Um, remember that uh, the study was done with some kind of uh, uh, a certain component of advantage for the patient with HEP-B and could have really influenced the outcome a little bit in that regard. But also remember uh, what we really sometimes uh, uh, understate is we don't have control about what patients get afterwards. And if anything, really, this could have been panning out this non-inferiority component per se. But again, I like what Mark said, which is at the end of the day, it was designed to be non-inferior. It showed to be non-inferior. And add to this, we got some freebies in regard to the PFS and response rate. Why not? This is great news for the patients per se. And now it brings another important point, which just Manish started to, to, to talk about in regard to the uh, adverse events or the tolerance of the lymphatinib. Mark, Mark any, any, any thoughts uh, either from experience or your interpretation of the data? Yeah, I mean, the data is pretty clear that, you know, uh, serafinib is going to blister your hands with some frequency, and you don't see that nearly as often with uh, lymphatinib. That's very important. Uh, if anything, uh, what will be a common side effect, if anything, I would need to worry about with lymphatinib? 
um, high blood pressure. High blood pressure, uh, like yeah. uh, which uh, I know how to fix high blood pressure. <laughs> 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 but but it's it's fascinating that the uh, 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 foot syndrome. Uh, it's something that no doubt probably we can control and we really can have good hands on, but you're right, the perception in the uh, community is not necessarily something that people are very receptive to in regard to the management. And so no doubt that the adverse events profile kind of play a role a little bit here in that in regard to the therapy. But I'd like to go kind of back to comment at least on what Mark said, which is at the end of the day, what's fascinating is that uh, the uh, uh, choice of therapy uh, based on the etiology being Hep B versus Hep C is not there yet. And if anything, these drugs could be used across the board for everybody without any specific limitation or a concern about who might benefit from the, uh, from the drug versus not. And one, one other comment yeah, about levatinib is that uh, it can be taken with food. Minor difference, and it's only taken once a day. But with serafinib, it's multiple pills twice a day on an empty stomach, you know, the classic one hour before and two hours after eating. Well, I, I consider it to be important as well. You know, this is rather a very practical uh, component of the use of uh, lymvatinib. Uh, remember, patients will have a problem to begin with to eat, and we're going to make them start further. I, I can understand your point. I mean, please. Yeah, so I just want to bring up two points. The first sure. is... Um, you know, we, we have this concept of stage migration and transitioning, and we often think of stage, stage migration as progressing, right? So you progress from local regional therapy to systemic therapy, because that's traditionally what we've been doing. I think the idea that you can have these objective response rates is interesting, because you can actually have stage migration the other way. Mm -hmm. And so theoretically, there are patients where you can actually have a large tumor where you actually get an objective response rate, and you may be able to then do local regional therapy in the future, which I think is interesting as we start to see therapies which are giving you higher objective response rates. I like what you say. If anything, always whenever I'm discussing with patient and family, I always say, and they ask those questions, I say everything remains on the table in regard to HCC. And this, I totally agree with you on that.